Tim Weiner is one of America's great reporters and writers on American intelligence. He's got a new book. It's called Enemies, A History of the FBI. It's reviewed for us by Kevin Baker, who says this is an important and disturbing new book. And he says, Weiner has done prodigious research, yet tells this depressing story with all the verb and coherence of a good spy thriller. I'm delighted that Tim is here to talk about his book. Welcome. Thank you, Sam. Why is the FBI's history so depressing? You know, it's not. I think it's incredibly exciting. And it is full of stories that you just couldn't make up. No fiction writer could make up J. Edgar Hoover. Well, let's start with Hoover. Tell us about him. How bizarre was he? I don't think he was a monster. I think he was a Machiavelli. I think he was a guy who learned how to use power better than anybody in Washington under presidents from Woodrow Wilson to Richard Nixon. And this book is essentially about what happens when America becomes a world power, a superpower after World War I and how its secret intelligence service, which is what the FBI is to presidents, it's not cops and robbers. It's spies, saboteurs, and people who want to blow up America and change the American political system. How presidents use this power, that is the story of J. Edgar Hoover. So take us back to Woodrow Wilson and the young J. Edgar Hoover. What was he doing back then? As American troops are landing in France in the summer of 1917. World War I. Right. J. Edgar Hoover joins the Justice Department. He's 22 years old. By the time he's 25, he's running the biggest counterterrorism operation in American history, arresting thousands of suspected anarchists, Bolsheviks, people who were opposed to the war, pacifists, rounding them up in dragnets by the thousands. Before he turns 30, he gets control of the FBI, and he runs the FBI from 1924 to 1972, 48 years, nothing like it in American history. What about Hoover? Let's talk about some presidents, Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt. What was their relationship like? FDR loved Hoover because he loved secrets and he loved secret power and he was quite an aficionado of intelligence. He calls Hoover into the White House one-on-one -on -one in 1936 and says, Edgar, I want you to develop a very clear picture of communists and fascists in this country. And Edgar says, yes, sir, in order to do that, I'll need to wiretap bug, break into their houses and uh, spy on them. And Roosevelt says, you go right ahead. Now, how legal is this? Not. <laughs> so why was he able to do it? <laughs> because he's the president of the United States and he's defending the country. Stalin's on the rise in Russia. Hitler's on the rise in Germany. Everybody knew the Japanese were gonna come at some point. They were fighting the Chinese. By 1939, we know there's gonna be a war. It's on in Europe. The Supreme Court outlaws wiretapping. President Roosevelt, in writing, tells Hoover to go right on ahead to protect the national security of the United States. Again, power, raw power, exercised through the FBI. Uh, Tim, you've been a great reporter for many years. How do you research a, a book like this? This isn't information people voluntarily give you. Well, in one case it is. The FBI has always been a pyramid of paper. But some of that paper has been buried and classified secret, top secret, and above top secret for many years. Just after I finished my last book, Legacy of Ashes, A History of the CIA, I got a call from a lawyer who said, hey, guess what? I just won a 27-year-old Freedom of Information Act suit against the FBI for Hoover's intelligence files. Would you like them? Yes, I said, I would very much like them. Um, the FBI has had a secret oral history program for many years, and they've just declassified in the last year about 208 of them. Incredible reading of careers of FBI who worked intelligence from World War II until after 9-11. How big was the FBI at its peak? How big it is at its peak. Is it now? Yeah. How big an organization is it? 30,000 strong plus. How much of that system, that bureaucracy, was created by Hoover himself? Was he a master of this? He was, among other things, the greatest bureaucrat of the 20th century. He's now been gone for 40 years. It'll be 40 years next month. The institution he built is more powerful, more adept. Uh, it's not all white guys and ties anymore, but it is his institution. He is the man who created 
the modern surveillance state. And every time we go out in the street in New York or London and a camera looks down over our shoulders, every time we go through an airport and our biometric data, our eyeballs and fingerprints are recorded, that's the system Hoover built. What was the relationship between the FBI and the CIA, say, during the Cold War? Dreadful. How come? Because Hoover hated the CIA. They were rivals. It was he wanted to run America's global intelligence service. And he thought the CIA were, you know, a bunch of cookie pushers. And they fought tooth and nail, and they continued to fight tooth and nail until September 11th, 2001. And their fighting was one of the proximate causes of the success of those attacks. They wouldn't share information. And has that been addressed in a meaningful way? Yes, because everybody knew within an hour after the attacks what their jobs were going to be for the next 10 years. Uh, counterterrorism. Intelligence, secret in- intelligence operations, counterterrorism operations, our job one at the FBI, and job two, and job three, and job four. Tim, what about uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the Kennedys? Hoover had a problem with Bobby Kennedy, who was the Attorney General of the United States. Hoover had taken over the FBI in 1924. Bobby Kennedy was born in 1925. And Hoover didn't want to have this young whippersnapper telling him what to do. They fought hammer and tong every day of the Kennedy administration and after the president died when Bobby stayed on at justice. Bobby was, on paper, Hoover's boss. But Hoover wasn't following orders from him. And there's been talk for many years, and you discussed this, the material, the information, the dossiers Hoover would have on someone like John F. Kennedy. How did he use that information? Well... He only had one piece of hot scoop on John Kennedy, and he'd had it for 20 years. In 1942, the FBI was following a very interesting woman named Inga Arvad, a very beautiful young woman who had, among other things, been Hitler's publicist at the 1936 Olympics. They thought she was a Nazi spy. And they followed her down from Washington. She met a young Navy lieutenant for an afternoon of pleasure at a hotel that weekend. That was John Kennedy. The FBI had bugged the hotel room. So Hoover let John Kennedy's father, Ambassador Joe Kennedy, who was a very close personal friend of his, know about this little uh, assignation and the fact that it was on tape. Shortly thereafter, uh, if Jack Kennedy's father knew, Jack Kennedy knew. So was this blackmail? Well, it takes two to tango if you want to blackmail somebody. Uh, Hoover thought he was doing... uh, Joe Kennedy a favor. What about Hoover and Martin Luther King? Hoover hated Martin Luther King with a deep and burning passion, not simply because Hoover was a racist, which he was, but because Hoover believed, and with good reason, that King's closest white confidant, speechwriter, ghostwriter of books, counselor, a man named Stanley Levison, had been a member of the secret communist underground in this country in the mid-50s. Not the Communist Party, the underground espionage network that reported to Moscow. And Hoover believed that the civil rights movement was, in effect, a cat's paw of communism. He was wrong about that. But his hatred for King grew deeper and deeper and deeper. And at the time King was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, Hoover and the FBI went all out to destroy him with sex tapes and other evidence that Dr. King had relations with women who are not his wife. No paper would print that, but he spread that dirt around and President Johnson knew it. Tim, is it possible for there to be another figure who amassed just the personal power and influence over our government and society that this one man did? It will never happen again and with good reason. Because that is not the way you run a secret intelligence service in an open democracy with one man holding that much power for that long. Uh, The FBI is 103 years old, and there's reason for hope because over the last three years, uh, they have got this struggle, this balance struck between civil liberties and national security better than they ever have before. This is what they wake up to every day, this challenge. We want to be safe and we want to be free. 
we want our civil liberties and we want national security. And the struggle between liber liberty and security never ceases because they are opposing forces. The FBI has to get this right. And their director today, Bob Mueller, I believe, who has now served longer than any director since Hoover and will continue to serve through next year, really cares about this. He cares about getting this right. They're trying in a way that they've never done before to strike that balance. And that's an extraordinary thing. Thanks so much, Tim. Thank you, Sam. That's Tim Weiner, whose new book, Enemies, A History of the FBI, is reviewed in this week's book review.